wasn't with no uh, organization no more because then all the older guys, like I said, they started fading away. So that left a void, and that gave me an opportunity to rise up, you know, because like I told you, I was a soldier before I was anything, a chief. I was a soldier, and I took orders, and I did what I, I put in a lot of work. I'm going to put it like that. I put in a lot of work. So we, had, we covered from Halstead to Cottage Grove from maybe 87 to the hunt, the beginning 99th to hunt. So now when the guys that was in charge start stepping away, it gave me a chance to come up, you know, rise up, be recognized. But I'm known all through the community. So now it's been leadership and everybody looking at me, you know, looking towards me. I ain't going to say default because I put in a lot of work. So it just happened because I was true and, and they knew I was real. We're going to say hundreds. And that's how I took over the, the uh, syndicate, Blackstone Syndicate Ranger that I was in play with hundreds of guys. Well, you, I, I just told you we stepped away from the Blackstone, so they was mad. They was upset. Then we, we surrounded by uh, disciples. Yeah, we surrounded by disciples on 95th. We just surrounded by, I think, three different disciple organizations at that time. I told you we had a pool roll on 95th and Wentworth across the street from the project. The project is the lone home, and in back of that, it's Preston Park. So I'm in the projects all the time with my guy, and when Didi would get through shooting pool or whatever, because he came up there, he was hanging with the older guy. So when he would come over to the project, he was observing. He was watching, watching me moving around. I guess he had inquired about me, and they, you know, the older guy told that she was, you know, he, you know, he the man now, and uh, this his thing. So eventually, he approached me. You know, he approached me one hot day in the summer of uh, 1968. I can't say what day, what month, but uh, it was the summer of 1968. I'm 17 years old, and he approached me. And he was like, uh, man, all these young guys, I've been watching you. I'm like, yeah, these are my guys. He said, you know what? I said, what? He said, I got a guy that's on the same thing you want. And he said his name, Larry Hoover. And, you know, me, I'm like, who? Larry Hoover. Now, I never heard of Jeff Ford, David Boxtell. Nicky Cobwell, I have heard all these guys, but I never heard of Larry Hoover. So when he said Larry Hoover, I was like, oh, okay. So he, in, he said he in Inglewood, down on 68th Street, around Gray, Harset, around there. I want you to meet him. Well, I said, you know, okay, you know. I'll meet him. I told him, yeah, I'll meet him, but, you know, I put it off. I put it off. I wasn't in a hurry to go down there. I'm already a chief. Every now and then, I'd see Didi uh, come over to the projects, and he'd ask me, when you gonna go come down here with me and meet my man? I said, man, I'm gonna do it, man. Just give me a minute, you know? I'm gonna do it. So eventually, it got hot. I say about June, July, I'm um, standing on the corner of 95th and Wentworth, and Didi pulled in what, off in what we call a trap car. You ever heard of a trap car? Windows didn't come down. No air condition or nothing. All the cops are for a ride up on me, man. What would have been like a story? No, no, no. It's a car he owned, but, but it didn't nothing all he worked. No air condition, no radio. The windows don't come down, so we call them truck cars at the time. He pulled up and told me, Come on, man. You ain't doing nothing. Come on down here and meet the chief. I said, Man. I said, All right. So the, door, the window didn't open. Door was messed up, so I had to climb through the passenger side to get into the car. No air conditioning, nothing. And it's hot. That's why I say it's probably July, August. It was hot that day. So we talking and stuff. He take me to 68th and Green. It's a playground. The pegs sweet was sore. They showed in an American gangster when they was talking about who was. It's a playground where we all used to meet at, 68th and Green. So I go down there, 
Didi, Clover. This is maybe about four or five guys in the playground. Maybe about four or five in the evening. Maybe a little early, about three, four in the, in the afternoon. So they out there in the playground. So he introduced me to a few of them. This U.S., woo, 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 he's from 95th. I'm finna go get Chief and bring him down here so he can meet him. So off he went to go get Larry Hoo. So I'm kicking it with the guys that he just introduced me to. Now, man, you, I've never been down there in my life. <laughs> he ain't said, I'm down in Inglewood. I ain't never been on 68th Street, but I'm down there to meet Larry Hoo. I'm standing there for a little while. We talking, we kicking it. So I'm looking down gray. I see two individuals coming up, coming up gray. I seen one was Dini, and then I seen a little chubby fat guy like. And I'm looking, he got a process. So I'm saying to myself, I know that ain't Larry Who. <laughs> I'm just looking. They have maybe a half a block, quarter of a block down. So it sure will. So they come up in the, in the playground. And I never forget it, man. Didi say, uh, U.S., this Larry, Larry, you, this U.S., this the guy I've been telling you about, whoop the bound bound, to more words to the exchange. Who would start talking it. He stuttered a little bit. If you ever been around, he, he stuttered. Man, I heard a lot of good shit about you. We could take this shit over. We could take this city over. I love, like, who is it? You know, what is he talking about? You know what I'm saying? I ain't never met him before. And he talking about taking over and shit. So I'm listening and shit. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. He said, man, come on. We used to say, hook up, you know. Hook up. You know, he's like, hook up with me. Me and your guys hook up. We can do a lot of great things together. I was like, hmm, okay. I said, let me think about it. Let me go back to the project. Talk to my guys. Because, you know, like I said, we had their stones. I was a star to the bone, and I had to take orders and do what I was told to do. But now we ain't stoned no more. Well, like I told you, it was the leadership up under me. I, I really don't know, you know, or say, you know, it could have been this, it could have been that. I always keep telling you, I was a soldier. I did what I was told to do. I didn't ask questions. I did what I was told to do. And I said, and I told Larry and Dee at that time, let me go back to the project and holler at my guys. So I go back, Didi bring me back in that hot car, smoking hot, no air conditioning or nothing. So we jump in there after the little meeting with Larry, or we go back to 95th. He hang out with me up in the project. So uh, all my guys is up there, like that was headquarters for my guy. So we all in there that night, and they was like, where you been? I said, I went down in Inglewood with Didi. He said, you went to Inglewood with Didi? You know, ain't brother. You just met Didi a month ago. You don't know Didi that good. <laughs> he didn't tell me that us. He didn't take me to us. He didn't take me to the I said, no, Didi cool. You know, I said, no, Didi cool, man. So, you know. So, all right, I'll tell you what happened, what transpired. And I'll tell him that Larry, who we want to hook up. That's what we called it. Hook up. That's what the mobs together. Yeah. They say, Chief, it's your call. Now remember, I'm 17 years old. I came up in a different era. You know what I'm saying? That's all I can say to that. I came up in a different era. Like I keep telling you, I did what I was told to do. I rose up from a soldier. Hit me out. I rose up from a soldier to a chief, to a supreme chief, to a king. You know, once I met him and started hanging around him and being with him, then the Jeff Ford, I don't, you know, the only two guys that, you know, like I got to say, really, I learned stuff from that, you know, was around at the time. And Jeff, I was around at an early age, a young age, but he was young too. But I didn't know. I think Jeff, like 26, 27, the way he barking out with us, you know, telling us what to do. I thought, what was this thing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, he, you know, hey, then when I met Larry, he was small, charismatic, you know. Talk, you know, hey, had ideas, had plans. We had a center where we fed uh, children before they went to school. And we, we did great stuff. We did some good stuff in it. No, you know, yeah, so David was still alive. So, did you meet him first? And David Bostel 
I used to see them every day on business relationships. We'll put it like that. What, what was no, uh, his personality, the, the fair for trash that was. He was cool. He was cool, laid back, you know, when he talked, you know, he meant what he said and everything. But yeah, I know David personally. I know Jeff, David, and Larry. I know all of them. David had a vision that if the, uh, the disciples in Inglewood and the gangsters in uh, Inglewood came together, that they would be powerful. And that's how you got the black gangster disciple nation. B, G, D, N. Say it again. Black gangster disciple nation came from David Bostell and Larry Moore. No, we feel it. We fought. Oh, yeah, we feel it. We fought. I was in it. I was in the mix. We feel it. We fought. But then David had a vision that if we come together, we'd be more powerful. And he brought it to Larry. And the rest is history. Now, remember what I said. B, G, D, it. Black gangster disciple of nation. I was up there the night he got shot. He came on 68th Street for him and Larry Hoover to go to the uh, guys and girls to go out. You know, they dressed up, they were going to party. Then, uh, I don't want to tell too much because that, you know, that little nigga know too much. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just going to say, went out, both dressed, we in the center. I'm going to make this clear. We on the center on 68th and Halston. Well, I told you we fed the kids for breakfast before we went. Now they look, they dressed up, and they all, you know. Community set. Gangster self. Oh. <laughs> community set. Yes. Gangster community. Yeah, gangster community. So we all in there. They finna go out. The two kings. The two kings. They finna go out and party. And, uh, you know, they got security. I'm going to put it like that. And when they get in the uh, guys and girl or weapon, accidentally discharged and that's how David got shot. I was up there the night that they went to the guys and girls together. Oh, so you you ain't saying that like wait wait like he accidentally got shot? I was saying he accidentally got shot. Oh wow. But man me he lived for a couple of years. Yeah we had that kidney problem. He was on a, a machine, the machine and all that. I but if that had happened today he would have died. Yeah, yeah they got yeah was it unexpected any time? Yeah. Why you gonna think he gonna die from that old gunshot wound? But he did eventually, like you said, a couple of years later. Okay, Larry Louvre, like I said, from Inglewood, 68, and Hofstad, all that area around there. Oh, uh, well, we managed with my book managed with his parents. They said Larry, I heard people come from the uh, Stateville or whatever and say that Larry said, talking on the galleries, on the yard or whatever, that he didn't know nothing past 70 nights and hosted till he met U.S. Floyd. When he met U.S. Floyd, I opened up the 80s, the 90s, the hundreds, everything. I had members in the hundreds. Before they started calling it the wild, wild hundreds, I am the hundreds. I opened up the hundreds. For other blocks and groups, you know, to come into the hundreds. From my perspective, what was going on when Larry got to Stateville, I had the opportunity to talk to him several times at what we call the tunnel. You know, they got these tunnels connected to the cell office in Stateville, and that's where I would meet him. When I got an opportunity, I would see him in a tunnel. Now, he come down there with 200 years. And I hollered at him, I embraced him and stuff, but we talking, and he, he tell me that, he fighting that case, that two running, that murder. It was a phone call that happened from a good friend of mine named Art, Arthur. And Art called me as a, not to let too much out, but there was some misinformation that had went out. And Art was like, hey man, you know, we got to answer this misinformation because there's too much of this out. And a, another brother that I call Texas Sean, but the rest of the world call Shy, OG Shy. And Sean had always, hey man, we got a document, we got a document. Now the guys is out, they're getting older, and a few of them has passed away this year and last year for sure. And 
We've got cats like Boomy Black that's gone and Murray Brown. Um, but then you got libraries like U.S. Floyd and Benny Lee and other men that are walking around. Uh, and I won't say their names until they're comfortable with their names. We we'll see it. That's what happened. His name. When they found him guilty, it, you know, the state's attorney, the judge, they already knew who he was, though. So. When he came down there, we talked in a tunnel a few times. He said that the most important thing was right then was getting back to a, to the strength and to his family. That's what he was really focused off. So, me as a representative of, you know, all the gangsters that's down there, I told him we just sit down. So, he said he was off count. Which, what does that mean? That mean he wasn't he wasn't a part of no organization. He wasn't you know he wasn't. So he sat down temporarily as gang member. Yeah, yeah. Before he got there, I'm gonna make that clear. That's pretty I'm gonna make that clear. So he wasn't a member when he got to state, but he wasn't a member on the street. He in, in the street he had involved into something else. So what what went on with that with that weas female horse? The far to play, you said, Fusco, what's in danger and what's he really in danger? I don't know. I can't say it was in danger because 95th Street, where I'm from, the whole lot of us down there at that time. It was people from other areas that was, you know, gangsters or whatever. You know, I don't think he was in danger. And I don't think he know was, you know, about him not being on count or whatever. He was still cool with all us. <laughs> Hell struggle. David had passed away. Everybody got their story. Him, he got a story, he got a story, but the fucking truth cannot be reputed. If it, if 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 there are sources that repeat the same story as you're gonna see later with US Floyd and Benny Lee, those stories were told from two different point of views, but they were the same story. So me, Art, and Shy got together to document that. And, you know, you came down and helped us document it uh, because we didn't want nobody else to help us. Like, there was a lot of cats that we could have called, but on my network that I, we say strong, call our prophet. Because Al going to keep that shit straight. He ain't going to mix it up. He ain't going to cut it, chop it. The shit going to be straight out, and it's going to be what it have said. So... When I brought the uh, gangster thing, that's what we call it, the Jeep thing, the gangster, Larry Hoover now, the 95th. So when the LSB 68. 67, 68, say 68. So when the older guy wasn't feeling it, they wasn't feeling it. This might have been a bad thing. They weren't feeling it. And they like US, and that's my nickname, US. You can't do that. I'm like, can't do what? Bring gangsters up here on 95th and we've been stalls all the time we've been in the streets in the gangs they were stalled but now i'm afraid to bring the gangsters up there let me rule it now and they didn't like it so well it's was an exchange and then i had to you know do my thing you know shut them down like hey i'm doing it you know and man you can't like, watch me so we got i got into it with some of the older guys before i'm playing I got into it with some of the older guys that used to be leaders or whatever. I laid it down. We're going to be gangsters and that's it. Shootouts, you know, like that. At this point, Four is about to get sent away. Or he's already sent away. I don't know if he was sent away, but this is a true story. Fort came back to 95th and tried to talk to guys, the older guys. This is right around that time, like 69. Well, right after we even stepped away, I say, shook the eight. You know, he came with some of the main 21, try to talk them into coming back into the uh, Blackstone Rangers, but they said, no, or moved the bound bound, so he left. You know, but he did come back up there. What's wrong? Why y'all back up? You know what? You know, there's no real like feet. No, he let him go. They said they didn't want to be a part of that no more or whatever, so he let him go. Well, it was a willing thing to what could like force me. No, nah, we wasn't kicked out or nothing. They just stepped away. Like I said, a lot of them went to the Army, to the Vietnam War. Heroin came into play. Uh, yeah, so by a crab so between uh, 
Some of them went away in what, 70? 73. 73. Oh, Kirsten. So that's 74 before. And they have four or five year hearing it. Society in general, everywhere, saying, What? Dude, my heart has cried really off the road of your addiction and the streets. You really proud to do for really? I don't know. I'm to add it. How did your light turn? Well, like I said, we had laws that we had to follow and everything. And we really kept drugs out of our community, heroin and all that. But then, after we got introduced to selling drugs, we ran all the drug dealers out. And we took, that's how, that's just what happened. At first, we were not no, let selling no drugs to our community, to our people in our neighborhood. But man, that was a lot of money. So we ran them out and we took over. We started selling drugs. Well, uh, it seems that it just great movie favorite article, but it seems like a lot of the favorite blood dealers weren't necessarily gang members putting no. their aid to make some type of alliance in order to operate them. And while they moved to Dave, a young guy to stand on the corner and all that. Yes, I had a, a certain individual. I don't know I'm going to say his real name, but I'll say his nickname. That cool? We'll say his nickname. We call him Brick. He might have been 50, 48, 50. And he was a big, big drill dealer in our area. He used to get us anything we wanted. He gave me a, in 1967, 68, he gave me a 1964 El Dorado, Cadillac El Dorado. Yeah, because we on his payroll, we selling drugs for him, his security, making sure, you know, the people that he had working outside of us wouldn't get robbed and everything. So he looked out for me, you know, he gave me money and, you know, everything. So now that's my first position in a drug game. But now I'm laying back. I'm like, hold up. Look at all the money this guy making. Yeah, that's working. My guys, well, oh, wait a minute. Stop, stop the car. He making a lot of money. Bought us guns, everything. So I flipped the script. One day, came to get his money. And that happened, man. You, you got to pack your bags. You got to move on. We, we going to start selling this, selling that. You know what I'm saying? You would, you would, how, you would make some connections. Yeah, yeah. We, we found out. We found out one of our guys. Daddy knew a guy that had it, that white, that shiny white. And we took off from there. We took off from that. No problem. Man, we had shootouts and everything, yeah. You know, he just ain't gonna go like that. He was making money, man. You know, so, you know, we, uh, we weathered that storm and everything. So, now we, a funny thing. Brooke went down to 68th and hoffed it to the center with Larry Roo at. He told Larry Roo, man, that nigga U.S. shut me down. Whoa, whoa, the bell, bell. I'll do this for you. True story. I'll do that for you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let me go talk to you at. You know, hold up. So he promised Hoover, hold on. Right. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? So he ran down there. He knew who the chief was. He ran down there to meet Hoover. And he, uh, you know, but it didn't work. I'm just going to say it didn't work. He didn't go to where he thought it was going to go. Well, how's that? I, I stayed now. And I talked to him. Well, oh, man, you know what's up. You know, it's my turn. It's my turn. We, you know, hey, he got his turn in. Yeah. Full beard. Well, we heard different versions of the story, but the guy who got killed, he had come home from Pontiac. He really was one of He came home. Yeah, he came home from Pontiac prison after serving a bit. And he made some bad moves. I'm going to put it like that. He started sticking up several Americans who had in the 68th Street area, in the Inglewood area. And you know that wasn't going to fly, so. So it happened. Oh, when he went, he got locked He allegedly got locked up for killing him. He got locked up for allegedly killing him. Allegedly. When, or oh, why would we be so loyal to him? He was a good guy, man. A good guy. He took care of a lot of people. Took care of a lot of families and stuff, you know what I'm saying? 
And that's why he's still respected today. He was fell. I'm going to say that too. And one thing I want you to know, the guys on 95th Street, the older guy, they still probably dislike me today because I brought the gangster thing up there. And it's still up there right now today. It's still up there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm bringing that gangsters up here. What you doing? Man, I'm doing what I want to do. It's my turn. Yes, I did. <laughs> I took Wix Bob. And, and what, so by the age of 20 years, to make the album with what? Man, I can't, I don't know. Well, I had workers. I had guys on the payroll. I ain't going to tell you what they was on the payroll for, but I had several different payrolls with guys was on, you know. Most people work every day before all call. There you go. And you hit it right on the head. So, you know, we made a lot of money. We made a lot of money. I think they showed us on, uh, they showed us on, uh, what's that, CBS? Uh, come on on Sunday. Still do right now today. Oh, 60 minutes. 60 minutes. They showed our area on 60 minutes and said that, that it was, you know, niggas start flipping and telling, catching cases. And on 60 minutes, they was talking about drills in Chicago. And they showed our strip it's one thing. In the 70s? Yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, 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 I'm going to say seven. So they showed our strip and said this was a multi-million dollar strip, you know, and the feds was investigating everybody up there. And every, no, we didn't get the recall, but, you know, they was on me. Well, I'm just going to say, uh, I had cases ever since I turned a, the adult age, 17, 18, legal stuff, thing, you know, came into play for me because, you know, I was doing my thing, so I was, you know, was law enforcement was on me. I had uh, a organized crime, Chicago organized crime unit investigating me. Set up your boy after life, man. Okay, this I I'm gonna end this with this. Everybody gonna have their own version of what happened. I was in the penitentiary with Larry Lewis, you know, when he first came to uh, Stateville. Like I said, everybody gonna have their own version. It was some misunderstandings, you know. But Don Durkee, I know him personally. He'll tell you I know him personally. Our U.S. Floyd was absolutely, it was like, if you could close your eyes and listen to the story, uh, with the pictures that they show uh, us afterwards, most of the stories that U.S. Floyd told and could come from under, dude, you would have to be like, like, you, those dudes are built different. Like, you got, oh, I'm going to give you 200 years, you're going to get 80, you might get 1,000, you might get, just to hear that shit was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, it breaks, people go on mental breakdowns and or they start using drugs or... To be in a room with U.S. Floyd, who I respect. Um, and I remember I met U.S. and I, <laughs> somebody's like, oh, yeah, that's U.S. Floyd. And I'm like, yeah, I heard, man, like he got fucking like 100 years. He was like, no, that's U.S. Floyd right there. I was like, well, what the fuck? What do you mean? He got, a, he got like 100 years, so how the fuck is he out here? Like, it was like, nah, bro. He came from under that shit. He did it on his own terms. He didn't. He didn't do no funny shit. He didn't say nothing to nobody. Nothing. He just. I remember walking over to him. He was well dressed. I was smoking a cigar, and uh, just to see him sitting there, and he got up and he had a Federo, like you know, summer Federo, and, and he got up and he, how you doing, man? And one of the brothers introduced me and, and oh man I forget who that was but he walked me over to U.S. Floyd man and I remember shaking his hand and I took a picture with him that like instantly can I take a picture with him and he said absolutely he we took a picture and U.S. been my man ever since but just to watch somebody come from under where he come from and to have the connections streetwise that he had he could have did anything like anything but to know him and benny lee knew each other personally 
in prison and free on the town and laughing and joking. It's like, what the, what the fuck was we fighting for if they knew each other? And that was meeting U.S. was like getting you gay. Every time he saw you, he dropped drop a fucking building on your head of information just shit that'll catch up with you two three years from now and you just be sitting somewhere and it'll just whoop oh shit that's what he meant oh shit and then you call him and he always pick up his phone hey man murray brown murray was like big brother that's who introduced me to u.s floyd god rest his soul a great man that's who introduced me to him 